Between the shadows of reality and the fringe of our own fears lurks a world of monsters. Strange creatures and frightening phantoms who test the very boundaries of our science and superstition. It's a realm of mystery and legend, a place of fact and fear. This is Monstro Bizarro. The black 57 Chevy was topping 100 miles an hour as it raced down the county road, but the thing was still in pursuit. It was flying just behind the vehicle, gliding back and forth without even flapping its huge wings. Go faster, one of the four passengers screamed as she watched it from the back seat. The creature had red eyes that glowed in the reflection of the taillights. It was as big as a human with wings like a gigantic bird. Its shadow passed over the car again as it let out a strange sound. The driver kept his foot on the pedal as he raced in the direction of Point Pleasant, a tiny little town in the hills of West Virginia along the Ohio River. Little did he or the other three passengers know, they were bringing with them a story that would become one of the most famous tales in all of paranormal history, one whose wings have literally spread worldwide. The story of Mothman. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Lyle Blackburn, and our guest is Mothman, one of the most infamous of all cryptid creatures. If you have an interest in these type subjects, you've no doubt heard of it and probably seen a few television shows or documentaries that cover the story. It's definitely one of the most popular. On this episode of Monstro Bizarro, I'll be bringing you the story of the creature's origin according to the original witness interviews. It may seem beyond belief, but this, my friends, actually happened. It was November 15, 1966. The four people in the car were being pursued by a bizarre entity unlike anything they'd ever seen. Just a few minutes earlier, at around midnight, the two couples, Linda Scarberry and Roger Scarberry, Steve Mallett and Mary Mallett, had been driving in a place known as the T&T area, six miles north of Point Pleasant. It was a wooded area full of twisting back roads that had once been used by the military to hide munitions in the war. Now it had become a lonely, deserted spot where young people would often come to park or hang out. On this night, the couples were driving near an old abandoned power plant building that loomed above the landscape like a giant sleeping monolith. Suddenly, Steve noticed what appeared to be two large glowing red circles reflecting in the car's headlights. As he yelled for the others to look, Roger, who was driving, hit the brakes as Mary shouted, What is it? As the headlights focused on the location, they realized the red circles were actually eyes that belonged to some kind of tall, gray, humanoid-like figure with wings folded behind its back. They watched as it turned and shuffled on two legs towards the door of the power plant, which was slightly open and hanging off its hinges. The couples could not believe what they were seeing. It was like a half-man, half-monster, a bird thing that stood as tall as a man. They had not been drinking or doing drugs. They were stone-cold sober, and their vision was clear. There was no doubt as to what they were seeing. Roger quickly turned the car around and sped from the TNT area. Linda urged him to hurry. Roger turned onto Route 62 and headed towards Point Pleasant. As they passed County Road 13, they were shocked to see the bird thing perched on top of a small hill not far from the road. To their horror, it unfurled its wings and launched straight into the air at a high rate of speed. Roger floored the gas pedal as the bizarre entity began to pursue them, swooping in behind the car. Roger estimated that he reached a speed of 100 miles per hour 
yet the thing was still able to keep up. It was gliding back and forth over the car, only occasionally flapping its wings to gain more speed. They could hear something hitting the top of the Chevy, perhaps wings as the thing swooped across it. The airborne creature pursued them until they reached a lighted area at the edge of Point Pleasant. At that point, it veered off into a field and disappeared into the darkness. The couples were frantic. The women were screaming. Roger drove to a local restaurant called Dairyland so they could calm down and discuss what to do. Linda suggested they report the incident to the police, but Roger and Steve were not in favor of it. They felt the police would just laugh it off or suspect them of drinking. The men thought perhaps they should go back and see if the thing was still in the area. Get another look. Linda and Mary tried to convince their husbands not to go back, but after a few minutes, Roger began driving back down Route 62 toward the TNT area. After several miles, however, the group thought the better of it. Perhaps the creature was dangerous, and they might have been lucky enough to escape the first time. All of this was so much that Roger slowed down and began to turn the car around. As they were turning, they noticed a dead dog lying on the side of the road. They didn't recall seeing it there before. Suddenly, something came from behind a tree. It jumped over the rear end of the car and disappeared into a dark field. Was it the creature? They were not sure, but they didn't want to hang around any longer to find out. At that point, the couples decided they had to report the incidents to the police regardless of how they might sound. Roger then drove to a drive-in called Tiny's, where an officer could usually be found on any given night. When they didn't find one, they asked a friend named Gary to call the police. When the police arrived, they decided it would be best to follow the couples in their car back up the road to see if they could see anything. Gary jumped in his own car and followed directly behind Roger. The police cruiser followed behind Gary. As they were driving towards the TNT area, the Scarberries and Mallets all saw the strange creature again in a field. It quickly came up behind their car, but when Gary's headlights rounded a bend, it flew off. They didn't see anything else, so the group eventually returned to Tiny's Drive-In where they located Deputy Millard Halstead of the Mason County Sheriff's Office. He listened to the panic-stricken couples as they told him about the incredible events. As strange as they sounded, Halstead took them seriously. He had known the young witnesses all of their lives and knew they would not make up such a wild story. And how could they be faking such emotion? Halstead could literally see the fear in their eyes and hear the stress in their voices. This was definitely no joke. Halstead hopped into his patrol car and followed Roger as he once again drove towards the TNT area. When they arrived at the site of the old power plant, the couples, along with the deputy, looked for any signs of the mysterious winged creature. Halstead shined his high-powered searchlight into the darkness, but the thing was nowhere to be seen. The deputy switched on his police radio to contact the dispatcher in Point Pleasant. As the story goes, a loud, screeching noise blared through the speaker. It was a garble of static, like a record player or tape being played at high speed. The deputy switched it off. The situation was growing spookier and stranger by the minute. The coal black darkness, the looming power plant, and the lonely woods all seemed foreboding. The group had been there for about 15 minutes when a bizarre squeaking sound echoed in the darkness. A shadow swept across the powerhouse and moved towards a hill beyond. Linda and Mary saw red eyes and quickly told the deputy. When he shined his light in that direction, they could see what looked like dust coming from the ground. But they did not see the mysterious winged humanoid. Halstead declined to search the abandoned building, but he didn't need to. 
He was convinced the couples had seen something, something that at present defied explanation. Something that could very well have been somewhere in the old building or in the nearby woods watching them. As the only officer present, he was not comfortable doing an extensive search. By the time they returned home that night, the couple simply could not sleep. The vision of the gray, flying creature kept playing in their heads like a looping sequence on a scratchy film reel. It was like a droning nightmare that not only kept them up at night, but would haunt them for years to come. The couples eventually provided written statements to the police detailing everything they had seen and experienced. Linda Scarberry described the odd creature as accurately as she could in her statement. To me, it just looked like a man with wings. It was a dirty gray color, and it has a body-shaped form with wings on its back that came around it. It has muscular legs like a man and fire red eyes that glow when the lights hit it. There was no glowing about it until them lights hit it. I couldn't see its head or its arms, and I don't even know if its eyes were even in a head. When we came down that straight stretch by the armory, it didn't even seem like it had any trouble keeping up with us. It must have had very powerful wings. I know people are laughing at us, but this is no laughing matter. We'll never forget this thing. It's affected our lives in many ways. The following morning, November 16th, Mason County Sheriff George Johnson held an impromptu press conference to discuss the incidents with the press. A reporter named Mary Heyer, who wrote for the local Athens Messenger newspaper, was in attendance. She interviewed the four witnesses and relayed their story to the Associated Press via the wire. Within a matter of hours, it became a newspaper sensation. The creature was initially called the bird but that was soon eclipsed by a more sensational, catchy moniker when a copy editor decided to give it a name inspired by Batman, who had a popular television series at the time. Soon, Mothman would become a household name as the sightings continued and a legend unfurled its wings. Sightseers clogged the roads north of here Wednesday night as Mason Countyans flocked to the desolate TNT area to join in a search for the monster Mothman. Sheriff's deputies reported that two couples told them that they had sightings of the creature Tuesday night near the old powerhouse five miles from Point Pleasant. It has been variously described as a flying man with a 10-foot wing spread capable of pursuing cars at 100 miles an hour and as a huge gray and white bird with wings like an angel and legs like a man. Seven feet tall with two large red eyes about six inches apart. Following the press conference, locals began driving out to the TNT area to search for the monster themselves. By nightfall on November 16th, the roads were clogged with cars and the woods crawled with people some of whom were armed and ready to end the mystery once and for all with a bang. It was a headache for law enforcement who were worried someone would get hurt in the process, and not by Mothman. Officials estimated that as many as 1,000 people had come to the TNT area by Thursday. The TNT area had an ominous reputation even before the Mothman. The land was, and still is, part of the McClintic Wildlife Management Area located in Mason County about six miles north of Point Pleasant. It now encompasses over 3,500 acres of farmland, woodlands, and wetlands. During World War II, the area had been used as a location to manufacture and store ammunition, operating under the name West Virginia Ordnance Works. Nearly 100 large concrete domes often called igloos or bunkers, were built into the ground to house the explosives. They were constructed so as not to be visible from the air. A power plant was also built on the site and once employed as many as 3,500 workers at its peak. It operated from 1942 to 1945 when it was shut down and abandoned after the war. 
Not surprisingly, the area was later found to be extremely polluted by the chemicals used to make the ammunition. The excess had literally been dumped into the soil. The toxic chemicals slowly seeped into the many ponds and waterways of the area to essentially create an environmental disaster. The North Power Plant building would eventually be demolished in the 1990s, but at the time of the first Mothman sightings, it stood like an enormous, dilapidated reminder of the horrible war that marred the world during the mid-century. The building may be gone now, but the igloos are still there, hidden under the overgrowth like huge, hollow turtles. Visitors can push their way through the tangled vines and enter through the rusted metal doors. The now empty structures have a rounded ceiling that creates a bizarre sensation when footsteps and voices echo within them. It's disorienting, to say the least. I've visited the area several times over the years and on more than one occasion entered the various igloos and walked the woods at night. I'm not really surprised that such an area gave birth to a monstrous legend. The place seems to have a looming haze of strangeness that rivals few others I've visited in my life. Even without knowledge of the Mothman incidents, I think the area would still exude an eerie atmosphere of hidden secrets and tragedy that was inflicted both on the land and upon humankind by way of the deadly munitions that once shipped from its origin. The Mothman, it seems, was just the next chapter in its unsettling history. Marcella Bennett and her brother Raymond Wamsley were not part of the crowd searching for the so-called monster on that Wednesday, so it was ironic that they would be the next to experience its haunting presence. On the night of November 16, 1966, one day after the whole thing had started, Raymond Wamsley and his wife Kathy, along with his sister Marcella and her two-year-old girl Tina, had driven out to visit Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Thomas, who lived close to the TNT area. As they drove, they noticed a red light moving in the sky directly above it. The light didn't look like an airplane, though they couldn't figure out just what it was. When they arrived at the Thomas's residence, Ralph and his wife were not home, only their three children. After a short visit with the Thomas kids, Raymond, Kathy, and Marcella began walking back to their car with Tina resting in Marcella's arms. The strange red light was still visible in the sky over the TNT area. Raymond stopped to look at it while Marcella kept walking to the car since she had the keys. As she looked down and began to unlock the car door, she noticed what looked like legs standing in the shadows behind the vehicle. She thought it was a man but quickly realized it was something else, something very different. Miss Bennett was interviewed several years ago by documentarian Jonathan Heat. This audio is from that interview. We visited for approximately maybe an hour and a half, and we decided that we was to journey back home. So uh, we went, my brother and Raymond Wamsley, and I myself and his wife, Catherine Wamsley went out, and uh, my brother Raymond kept saying to me, Marcella, look to your right at this uh, light in the sky. And I said, oh, no, hope was, you know. And I kept walking, and he said, no, you've got to see this. It's not a plane. And I just more or less was drawn to, to keep walking ahead towards my automobile that I had parked. And I was the driver that night, and he kept trying to get my attention to come back, come back, and I, I kept walking. And when I got to the car, I had my daughter, uh, Tina, and I was carrying her. And instead of going to the driver's side, I went to the passenger side. And I was a driver that night. So I thought, well, it's strange I'm here. But it was like kind of being pulled along, you know, going in the direction someone else wanted me to go in, maybe we'd say. And uh, I reached for the door handle on the car. And when I reached for the door handle on the car with her, my, Tina in my left arm, I saw this figure. And from somehow, I, I was looking, uh, holding onto the door handle, and I started at the feet. And I came up with my eyes, looking up. 
and I could see I saw no feet, but I saw gray, a grayish cast. And I kept going up, looking up at this creature, and it had wings like a bird with its neck stuck down and stood in a position about like this. And I thought, I never did see a red eye. I never saw the red eye. I don't know whether I was so frightened, but I did see a head like a bird go down into the shoulder part. And uh, I, I just, I just freaked out. I, I couldn't imagine what it was, and I knew it wasn't a human being, I, because it was gray in color, and the, the grayness was not clothing or skin. It was feathers. It was all gray feathers. At that point, I turned and tried to run back towards the house. And when I did, I, I couldn't walk. I got within maybe a foot from the creature. And uh, I fell face down, scratched at both knees, and I laid there on top of my daughter, which I could hear her crying. And I thought, well, um, my Lord, you know, she's, I'm, I'm going to suffocate her, but I can't get up. I'm helpless. So uh, by that time, I could hear my brother uh, in the background hollering, come on, Marcella, get up, get up, come on, hurry. And I kept trying by listening to his voice. Finally, when I did get to my feet, I tried to, I got her with a hand and tried to run, and I still couldn't run. But I walked fast enough that I could get where he was. He wasn't about to come where I was. He would not come and get to where I was because he could see the outline of the creature, you know. So I went back with him, and then we went in the house. And after we got in the house, he came to the door and tried to get in the door, which they, they had locked. And uh, I was just in and out. I, they took me to a sofa and laid me down on the sofa. And I, everything was kind of scratchy from there on out. I knew the Oliver Law Officer in Mason County was there, and lights, red lights are gone, and you know, sirens and all. But I just, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't grasp what I saw. Uh, I, at any moment, if you can try to imagine seeing something like that and then falling flat on your face and being paralyzed and not being able to move, I just was expecting any moment for him to reach down with the claws or whatever wing, whatever he had, and pick me up at the back and just fly away. I thought yeah, that was what was going through my mind, you know, well, this is it. As we did go in the house, I heard the flopping of wings. I, I recall hearing the flopping of huge wings. I mean, be on your imagination. And then my brother heard that too. And uh, they, then he it came and peeped in the windows. He looked in the windows, and uh, my brother had dialed 911, you know, and uh, told him we needed help. It was the most frightening experience I ever had in my life. I've never in my wildest dream ever thought that I would ever run into something like that and not be able to describe what I seen, you know. And it, it, uh, it was just uh, un unbelievable what, what I saw. By now, the Thomas kids had seen what was going on and were screaming. Marcella laid on the sofa and tried to regain her composure. Raymond locked the door as Kathy wiped the blood from Marcella's wounds. Raymond then placed a call to the Mason County Sheriff's Office and pleaded with them to send an officer. They had seen the Mothman and it was still outside. The creature had come up onto the porch and was looking in the window. Raymond and one of the Thomas kids saw it before it stepped back into the darkness and disappeared. The police arrived within 15 minutes and began searching the area with their guns drawn. As with the Scarberry Mallet case, they took the report seriously and did their best to conduct a thorough investigation. However, they could find no sign of the mysterious entity. It had simply vanished or most likely, flown into the night. Marcella was completely traumatized as she sat in the house trying to make sense of what she had experienced. Just like Linda Scarberry, her nightmares would last the rest of her life. Telephone calls continued to flood the sheriff's office here today concerning the creature which reportedly was sighted flying in the area Tuesday night. The latest report was that the Monster Mothman followed a motors to Cheshire, Ohio during the early morning hours. The next significant report came on Thursday, November 17th, 
from a 17-year-old boy who was driving along Route 7 in Cheshire, Ohio, just a few miles from Point Pleasant across the Ohio River. The boy said something that looked like a massive bird dove from the sky and followed his car for several miles. The following day, two firemen, Paul Yoder and Benjamin Enox, were in the TNT area when they saw what looked like a giant bird with red eyes flying above the trees. They were stunned. The same day, Kenneth Duncan was digging a grave at a cemetery in Blue Creek, West Virginia, when he looked up and saw something that resembled what he described as a brown human gliding over the trees. He observed it for about one minute before it flew out of sight. Blue Creek is about 50 miles from Point Pleasant as the crow flies, or, in this case, as the mothman flies. As the sightings made headlines on a daily basis, it created a media sensation. The stories were carried by many of the local West Virginia and Ohio newspapers, as well as others in the region by way of the Associated Press. The main source of Mothman information was a column in the Athens Messenger called Where the Waters Mingle, written by Mary Heyer. Heyer was a career journalist who had worked at the paper for nearly 25 years. She played a big part in the Mothman publicity, which was unprecedented at the time for something that was essentially a wild monster story. As the story circulated in the first week, more folks came forward to add their experiences to the timeline. One of these was Merle Partridge, who told of a strange incident that occurred at his home on Monday, November 14th, the night before the Mothman was first reported in the TNT area. Merle's name was documented as Newell Partridge in the original reports, but his name is actually Merle. Partridge and his wife were living near Salem, West Virginia at the time on a 115-acre farm. It was located about two hours northeast of Point Pleasant. Partridge said that around 11 p.m. on the night of November 14th, he and his wife were watching a movie when the television set began emitting a high-pitched sound like a generator. At the same time, his German shepherd named Bandit who was sitting on the porch began to let out a deathly howl. Partridge got up and turned off the television because the sound was hurting their ears. When he did, the picture tube exploded, sending glass outward onto the floor. Bandit was still howling outside, so Partridge went to the front porch to see what was the matter. As he stepped outside, he saw Bandit take off running into a field next to the house. Partridge yelled for his dog to come back, and normally Bandit would, but this time the dog just kept running. At that point, Partridge noticed some strange red lights at the far end of the field. They were sort of flashing on and off. His first thought was helicopter, but there was no noise from wind or propellers. The lights flashed for a short time, then went black. Merle called again for Bandit, but the dog was nowhere in sight. Not knowing what to think, he went back inside the house and eventually went to bed. The next morning, Bandit was still nowhere to be found, so Partridge walked into the field to investigate. He could see where the dog had run through the tall grass, so he followed the trail until he reached an area where the grass was flattened into a huge circle about 40 to 50 feet in diameter. Dog tracks could be seen all around the area, but there was no dog. There was an unusual quietness all around. No insects, no birds, nothing. It was rather unsettling. The next day, when Partridge heard the details about the Scarberry Mallet incident on the radio, which included the detail about the dead dog they had seen lying on the side of the road where the Mothman had been, Partridge put two and two together, thinking it could very well have been his bandit. Except how in the world did the dog travel from their isolated farm to Point Pleasant, more than 60 miles away? 
Partridge never claimed that the red lights he saw in his field were eyes, as most of the Mothman witnesses reported. He described them as more mechanical in nature. Either way, his story was inevitably linked to the Mothman incidents due to the time frame and the coincidence of the dead dog. Were these incidents indeed connected? Merle's report was just one of many incidents that would bring a UFO aspect to the Mothman case, an aspect that was greatly expanded upon in the coming weeks and months as people not only reported sightings of a bird-like creature, but sightings of strange lights and flying crafts in the sky. On Thursday, November 17th, Miss Roy Gross, a music teacher living in Ohio almost directly across from the TNT area, was awakened at 4.45 a.m. by her dog. The animal was barking wildly at something, so she got up to investigate. When she looked out the kitchen window, she saw an enormous object hovering over the treetops on the other side of Route 7. It was circular, the size of a small house, and brightly lit. It glowed with green and red lights, she said. Before Miss Gross could wake up her husband, the object made a sudden zigzag movement and disappeared from sight. Later that afternoon, the young man encountered the huge bird-like creature on the very same road, Route 7. A few days later, on November 20th, Brenda Jones and four other teenagers claimed they saw a man-sized bird-like creature standing beside a rock quarry near Campbell's Creek. They watched as it turned and scurried into the woods. Campbell's Creek is approximately 70 miles south of Point Pleasant. A week after Merle Partridge saw the red lights in his farm field, he was watching TV when someone began to bang on his front door. This was odd since the Partridges essentially lived out in the middle of the proverbial nowhere. Merle grabbed his gun, which he now kept at his side at all times, and went to the door. When he opened it, he was confronted by a frantic man who was pleading for help. The man said he was driving down the hill about a mile from the house when something took off beside the road, right beside his car. It looked big and had flashing lights, yet made no noise, and it was very fast. The man was not alone. He had a young person with him who he introduced as his son. The man said he actually had two sons in the car, but the other had gone missing. Partridge was puzzled, but he could tell the man was in earnest and genuinely needed help. So Merle loaded the two guys in his Jeep and drove to a spot where the man's car was stalled in a ditch just off the road. After they pulled the car out of the ditch, Partridge told the man he should come back to the house so he could call the police and report his son missing. However, just as they started heading back to the house, they noticed a figure walking up the road towards them. It was the missing son. When his father asked where he had been, the young man could hardly speak and he couldn't remember just where he had been. It was extremely strange. It looked like a bird as big as a plane and had legs like a man, the latest Mason monster sighter reported. Mrs. Mabel McDaniel of 30th Street Point Pleasant said she saw a dark colored flying creature with huge wings as she was driving on Jackson Avenue at about 5 p.m. on Wednesday. The reports of both man-sized birds and mysterious lights and crafts swirled in a mix of headlines and gossips in the weeks following the initial Mothman sighting. The stories began to meld together to paint a larger picture of high strangeness that circled above Point Pleasant like a massive shadow. No one was sure what was going on, but there was no doubt the little town had become an epicenter for a mystery that spread far and wide along the Ohio River Valley. In the words of journalist Mary Heyer, she wrote, What does a strange monster do to a town or a community? Or one might ask, what happens at the news desk of a paper? Since the strange creature was sighted in this area this week, 
It has brought more excitement than anything I've witnessed since I started working for the messenger nearly 25 years ago. I always said nothing could compare with the flood back in the days when the town would be covered just about every year. But this has created more turmoil and fear for many. My phone rings constantly about this happening, and if I could print all of it, I would have to write a book. As sightings of the Mothman continued throughout the remainder of 1966 and well into the following year, sightings of unexplained objects and lights in the sky also ramped up. These were combined with reports of so-called men in black who were seen on the streets of Point Pleasant and in some cases allegedly approached some of the witnesses to ask bizarre questions. These men were typically dressed in dark suits and hats and wore dark sunglasses. They looked as if they were government officials, yet often acted in a very strange manner. The whole of the phenomenon brought far more questions than it did answers. Some citizens, professors, and wildlife experts theorized that the Mothman was simply a sandhill crane that had dropped into the area while migrating southward. Dr. Robert Smith, associate professor of wildlife biology at West Virginia University, pointed out that sandhill cranes have a seven-foot wingspan with gray plumage and red flesh areas around the eyes. If a car headlight were to shine on the bird, these flesh areas around its eyes could appear as large red circles. This, he said, may explain the reports of huge grayish birds with big red eyes. Others, such as the sheriff, felt the creature could have been some type of heron. Herons are a wide-ranging species of bird, some of which can stand five feet tall while on the ground. They fly with their necks retracted, so that might give it a more humanoid appearance during flight. Others theorized that Mothman might simply be an owl, a bird whose wingspan can reach upwards of five feet. Their eyes do glow red when reflecting outside light sources, a characteristic that was definitely associated with the Mothman. The witnesses, however, remained adamant that this was not an ordinary bird they saw, whether it be common to the area or not. The long, human-like body, the unusually large eyes, and the speed at which the thing flew just could not be explained away in simple terms. The bizarre UFO activity was yet another matter, commonly explained away as weather balloons, planes, or even men with parachutes. But again, these explanations did not satisfy the witnesses, some of whom had been very close to the subjects during the incidents. Either way, it was certain that Point Pleasant had become the hub of some of the strangest phenomenon ever seen along the Ohio River Valley. The case was enough to catch the quick attention of writer John Keel, who came to Point Pleasant in order to investigate and document the various incidents. Keel would eventually pen a book called The Mothman Prophecies in 1975. The book was instrumental in capturing the stories and projecting them to readers well beyond the little town in the years to come. It was the basis for a modern legend, one that has inspired Hollywood movies and appealed to countless fans and researchers. The case of the Mothman is truly fascinating, even so many years later. sound means it's time for Monstro Mail, where I answer your most monstrous questions. For this episode, I'll be addressing a question that I've received from two different listeners. Brent Zias and Stephen Helm both asked if I know anything about the so-called Houston Batman. For those that aren't familiar with this case, it's one that's very appropriate to our Mothman discussion since it can be classified as a flying humanoid. This is a category of cryptids or paranormal entities that are similar to Mothman. The case of the Houston Batman dates back to June 18, 1953. It was a hot, humid evening in Houston, Texas that night. Miss Hilda Walker, her husband Lloyd, 
and the 14-year-old daughter of their landlord were sitting on their porch at 2.30 a.m. when all of a sudden they saw a dark, shadowy figure settle into a tree a short distance away. They described it as a creature about six and a half feet tall with large wings folded at the shoulders. It was wearing a black cape and skin-tight dark pants and tall boots. It looked like a man, yet also seemed creature-like. The entity was balanced on a tree limb and had a dim gray glow around it. Miss Walker told reporters from the Houston Chronicle that it looked like, quote, a Batman. The trio sat there watching the thing for several moments, literally dumbstruck by the bizarre sight. Then suddenly a white flame and smoke shot from behind it, and a, quote, burning object like a flying paintbrush scooted across the horizon. The Batman then faded from view. Two other individuals who lived in the home, including a Miss Myers, also caught a glimpse of the light in the sky and the shadowy visitor before it disappeared from view. None of the five witnesses could explain what they had seen, but they all agreed it was not their imagination. Details of the incident were reported to the Houston Chronicle newspaper, who ran their story on page 23 the following day. Police were also informed. They did some cursory investigation, but admitted they were not equipped to handle such phenomenon and had no idea how to approach it. No trace of the mysterious Batman was found in the tree or the area below where it had been seen. This single news report is the only source of the story and later attempts to locate the original witnesses have not produced anything. This was 1953, so quite a long time ago. The area where the Batman was seen has long since been devoured by urban expansion in the area. The entity in this case seems kind of like an extraterrestrial, given the weird outfit, the mysterious glow, and the object streaking across the sky. The whole thing seems derivative of 1950s pulp stories and comic books about strange invaders from space, and perhaps that's how the witnesses framed it at the time, even if it was more of a creature than a man. It seems unlikely that five witnesses could all be hallucinating or mistaken, so the question remains, what was it? Man from outer space, cryptid creature, or someone playing an elaborate hoax, which doesn't really seem possible. In a case where we have a single incident dating back nearly 70 years, there's just no way of knowing. The only thing we can say is that mysterious flying humanoids have been seen at many locations and at many different times over the years. Mothman may be the most famous case, but it's definitely not the only one. The story of the Mothman's legendary beginning has often been shrouded in a fog of confusion, blurred by the proliferation of books and movies, some of which distort the truth or the timeline. The sightings explained herein, however, are the actual incidents that were reported and documented at the outset. The very incidents that would carry this tale to worldwide fame upon its shadowy wings. The case of the Mothman is ultimately a complex one that combines many layers of strange phenomenon into a mystery of massive proportions portions that spread beyond the initial sightings of 1966. As it turns out, this was not the first time a large man-like bird was reported in the area of the Ohio River Valley. Oddly, similar sightings had occurred in the years prior to 1966. And, of course, they would not be the last. Sightings continued throughout 1967 up until the tragic collapse of the Silver Bridge on December 15th of that year. The bridge, which spanned the Ohio River between the small towns of Point Pleasant and Gallipolis, gave way that evening as rush hour traffic carried citizens homeward. 
46 people ultimately lost their lives in the cold waters of the river, making it one of the most tragic infrastructure disasters in U.S. history. Rumors that the Mothman was seen on the bridge just before the collapse brought new interpretations to the case. Was the creature an omen? A warning, perhaps? Or was it something more sinister? News coverage of the Mothman faded quickly following the collapse of the bridge, yet the story was not over. Sporadic sightings have continued to this very day. Point Pleasant has also become a mecca for paranormal enthusiasts who visit its iconic Mothman statue and museum or gather for its annual festival. The Mothman's true nature may still swirl in mystery, but its longevity is readily apparent. For as long as people continue to study the case and visit the eerie grounds of the TNT area, the Mothman will remain very much alive, flying the eternal night skies in the realm we know as Monstro Bizarro. For more information about my books, music, and research, please visit lyleblackburn.com.